Minimus podcast is brought to you by the physicians at Med School Coach and is part of the Prospective Doctor Network. Welcome to the Medical Menemis Podcast, your source for memory techniques and accelerated learning in higher education. Now, here's your host, Chase DeMarco. Today, we are joined by Michelle Miller, who holds a PhD in cognitive psychology. She's a professor at the Department of Psychological Sciences and President's Distinguished Teaching Fellow at Northern Arizona University. She has authored several studies and books involving memory, instructional design, and effective learning. And we're here today to find out how to improve our memory and effective learning. Michelle, thank you so much for coming on the show. Oh, thank you for having me. It's great to be able to talk to your audience today. I think this is going to be very interesting. You have so much research done on this and you teach a lot about teaching teachers how to teach and we're going to try to utilize some of this information for self-directed learning for the student population. But maybe you could tell us a little bit more about your academic background and the works that you've created in the past. Oh, thanks. Well, you know, I was trained several decades ago in my graduate program in a pretty traditional research-oriented academic path. And in particular, I was interested in working with my thesis advisor and my lab group to look at some really, really theoretical stuff around uh, working memory and also uh, some things having to do with language, how we take in linguistic information, which comes at us in this huge barrage every time we're listening to speech or even reading, and how we use our memories to manage during language processing tasks. And we also looked a lot at aging and how memory changes over the lifespan and things like that. So, you know, I really loved that work very much. And I still carry that through in the research I do today. But I did get really interested after I started working at Northern Arizona University. We're a very teaching-oriented place. And so I really got a lot more interested in the applications of these concepts to help us all live better and learn better and how we can create better courses. And on the flip side, how students can learn to be much more in charge of their own memories and their own learning. So that's some of the stuff that I've worked on more recently. And I've also gotten very interested in teaching with technology. And of course, you know, you can't talk about really much of anything in in contemporary life without talking about the role of the technology that works around with this. So I've also kind of come up with or tried to work on coming up with not just kind of theoretical research, but again, applications of, you know, how can we take what we know about how the mind works and better manage our own technology and use technology for learning. So that's some of what I've done as well. And that really kind of came together and gelled in the book I wrote that came out a few years ago called Minds Online Teaching effectively with technology. And so that's still really going strong, amazingly enough, given that it does have this technology angle. But I think part of that is because it is really a book that's anchored in cognitive principles, especially memory. So it's not a, you know, it's not a book about, oh, here's this tech thing that came out last week. Let's just focus on that. It's really more about those big overarching principles that do help us be better teachers and better learners, regardless of the discipline or the technology involved and so on. That's perfect. I know there are some, we'll say differences in the trainings like Sometimes these techniques will work better in this scenario or that scenario. But when we can take general principles that work for everyone all the time, then those are at least some of the easier ones for our students to understand when they're trying to teach themselves how to learn. And especially right now with COVID going on and everything else, it seems like the methodology of teaching online is, again, regaining a, a huge surge. So these topics are probably even more vital now with everything else going on and, and really advancing education in the current crisis and the future going forward. Right. I absolutely agree. It is such, it's a time to, for all of us to take a step back and say, all right, what is really at the core of what we're trying to do when we're learning? What's, what are the things that we most want students to take home from any learning experience? And then when you kind of have those general principles in mind, yeah, things like the modality we're teaching in or exactly, you know, how we're going to connect with our students, all that kind of falls away. So yeah, focusing on core principles, I think is a very timely thing as well. So for the student audience or mostly student audience, what are some of these core principles that they can implement now that they don't necessarily need a classroom to do, they can do on their own home studies? Right. So one of the things I think, especially for students in disciplines where memory is tremendously important, such as all those in the health-related fields, I think that 
students do pick up on a few techniques such as mnemonics. And I'm guessing that that's something that's talked about in one form or another with some frequency among your audience group. And so, you know, making a rhyme, getting the first letter of a sequence and, and using that to memorize or making up a, a story. And, you know, these are all good, but these individual mnemonics can be really just one trick ponies in a way if we don't look deeper at why they work. And that is, of course, what radically expands our ability to design a memory strategy for any given situation or set of information. So, so much of what mnemonics and memory shortcuts and tricks really, really do is they tap into principles such as structure. All right. So having some kind of a coherent structure that ties together and triggers a much more complicated body of information. So that's one of the things they do. So for example, if we're using the first letters to kind of cue us to a list, those letters oftentimes make up some other meaningful sequence. And so it's no longer just an undifferentiated mass of information we're trying to stuff in there. We've given it a little bit of a roadmap, a little bit of a structure that we can kind of hang on to. So that's a really, really key thing. And tracing that to an even kind of bigger principle is this idea that we have to stop thinking of our memories as kind of places to put things. And we put things there and they stay there just because we really, really want them to and we need them to. And that's, I mean, we know from hard experience that just wanting to remember something doesn't really do the trick, right? So our memories are not there as places to put things. Our memories are there as a part of our brains, part of our minds that were shaped by natural selection, by evolution to feed into, you know, job one for any living organism, which is to survive. So that's a mindset shift. We have to think of our memories as, you know, it's something that's there to help us do other things that are survival relevant, that are important. So, you know, in the modern context, it means we do kind of have to tweak things a little bit. So let's say that I do need to recall a list of terms or a set of steps, and that's what I really have to do. Well, on first glance, that doesn't look real survival relevant to my brain, right? It's just, it's kind of some words and, you know, there's not much going on there. Well, when I interpret that, when I say, wow, this is why this is important. This is why this is meaningful. This is the concept that ties this all together. Then mnemonic or no mnemonic, that starts to put my brain on notice that, hey, yeah, this is something that's relevant to me and that I need to hang on to. And, you know, here's another big principle is that as part of being something that helps you survive, your memory is very kind of economical. It sets a high bar for what it's going to hang on to, right? Because as many memory scientists have pointed out, if we just remembered everything, if we just sort of walked around like a video recorder and took in thousands and thousands of pieces of information all the time, that would crash the whole system. That would make for a very kind of non-useful system because it would be very hard to find what we needed when we needed. So our brains are being really selective and our brains are kind Kind of sorting through all the time. Okay, is does this relate to me? So giving things meaningful structure is a, is a really important way to tap into that. And there are a few other ways as well, but that's a really core principle that I think can get overlooked as we kind of throw, you know, different tips and tricks at students without really talking about what's going on underneath. And I think that's especially important in certain healthcare modalities where let's say, for instance, the instructors that are teaching them aren't really aware of effective learning strategies. And then the students probably were never taught before. So they go home and they try to learn in the traditional way, the same way they've been doing through undergrad and before that, but without maybe some more context or personal experiences. It's very difficult and something I hear from students all the time complaining about, how am I supposed to remember this? How am I supposed to find relevance for this seemingly arbitrary and massive amount of information? It just seems very difficult for them to really know where to go and what to use and what the next step will be. Right. And, you know, and and this has become so much the mission of this part of my career. It it does blow my mind sometimes that, you know, those of us on the teaching side, we're in the business of teaching people how to retain information. Information and memory and knowledge are what we're dealing with. But for different reasons, I mean, people just don't know some of the basic operating principles of memory. And partly this is because, you know, the idea of memory and memorization has fallen out of favor a little bit in education circles. I think that's changing a little bit, or at least we're talking about how knowing more can actually coexist with thinking better in an area. And there's some research to support that. But it is partly simply that within 
different academic disciplines, no space is made to, to learn these things. So absolutely, I think on the teaching side, we should know more. And I'll, I write and try to do so much outreach to do that. On the student side, though, yeah, I can see how it just looks insurmountable. And a couple of things, though, can help put this into perspective. So, I mean, first of all, again, with that structure, I mean, consider how it is we're just kind of going through our everyday lives. We're scrolling through our feed. We're walking around talking to people. I mean, that is also thousands and thousands of pieces of information coming at us. And we may remember it. We may remember very little. But absolutely, our brains are just not there to take in all of this information in just indiscriminate fashion. It doesn't happen. But here's an exercise I'll share with your audience today. This is one, it's kind of a little bit of a thought experiment that I use sometimes to kick off different workshops and talks that I do for more faculty audiences. But it's a wonderful thing to look at from a student perspective. So I also do this in classes. So think about this. So you can think about a movie line. So I, I sometimes frame this as a game and say, okay, we're going to play a little icebreaker game, which actually has this hidden purpose, which is to think about memory. So I, I say, are there lines from a movie or even a passage that you remember verbatim, right? And most people, you know, it's a fun activity because most people can go, oh yeah, you know, say hello to my little friend or have fun storming the castle. There are all these really memorable lines. And then I go, okay, that's really wonderful. What was the third sentence I said when I came in and started talking at this keynote today, and nobody knows. And then you really talk about why. I mean, this is a great starting point for kind of unpacking what are the factors that cause some things to be super memorable and other things to be just gone instantaneously, and how we can then kind of use those to hack the system, to make it work more, to save the things that we really do want and need, such as coursework. And, you know, even if we don't get into every single one of those factors right now, I would invite your audience to think about that. I mean, why is it that movie lines stick with us to such an extent? And other things that are really important don't. So factors like, hey, it fits into this overall narrative I understand, or I rehearsed it frequently. I was talking to my friends later, we we're all kicking around these lines. And every time you rehearse that or retrieve it, it's going to get stronger. Caring about the information, having an emotional charge that's tied in with it or an emotional reaction, having a rich image um, that goes with that movie line. All of those things are there and they're present in all of us. You definitely don't have to have special abilities or even a lot of extensive training training to tap into them. So that kind of reflection, I think, could help students see the principles, even as we hope that their teachers are catching up to those as well. So it sounds like maybe to hack the system in some medical terminology or medical studies for students, there are a few things they might be able to do. I know we cover visual mnemonics in particular a lot because they are are visual. So they're much stronger in our memory generally than maybe an acronym or initialization. At least I personally never found those very useful. We can discuss it with friends and see how much of the information we actually recall versus you know what we think we recall and kind of avoiding that illusion of competence. But we probably don't understand the whole storyline at this point like you would watching a movie. So I guess we need to use some of these tools to sort of hack our own memory and attention until we can get to that stage later on in our education. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if we think about all those things that we do remember so well, I think it's very encouraging. It helps us remember that we all do have the potential to expand what we can remember. It's all about technique. It's not about capacity. So what are some of these techniques that we can use or that the students can start implementing? Right. Well, I'm going to Let's maybe focus for a second on techniques that are specific to remembering terminology. And I'm going to actually contradict myself here a little bit, but only a little bit. This is the one area, so remembering new words, this is the one area where there probably are some capacity differences, some differences in how we're wired among individuals that make it a little harder for some and a little easier for some. Now, again, we're not talking about, oh, you've got it or you don't. Everybody has the ability to improve in this area with good technique but especially around verbal memory. We're calling that that's this area that I've been looking at for so long. Verbal memory, memory for words, memory even for whole sentences. There are a couple special considerations that come into play with this in particular. So when we remember new words, we're actually tapping into, there's, there's one little piece of memory that that's its, its main job. And it's sometimes called the phonological loop or phonological working memory. And if you've ever, you know, had to 
remember a phone number or you're trying to remember a sequence of numbers or something like that that's arbitrary and you kind of say it to yourself over and over, that's what you're using. So everybody's familiar with this, even if they haven't ever heard the term. Um, and it turns out that the job of this is, of course, not to remember phone numbers. That would never have been you know, selected for in evolution. It's really there to help buy a little bit of time while we make a new kind of memory representation, a new memory entry for a new word. So this little loop holds on to new sequences of sounds that it, it hears and picks up on, hangs onto them long enough for you to kind of run around with long-term memory and, and put something new together. And here's the thing is that phonological working memory capacity does differ pretty significantly from individual to, to individual. Some of us can only hold on to, you know, maybe a couple of pieces in a new word and other people can hold on to quite a few. And that does determine even things like how easy it's going to be to learn vocabulary in a foreign language. There's a fascinating series of studies on that. So knowing that, how does that help us have some techniques for learning new terminology? Well, I think it's good to kind of maybe do a little bit of self-diagnosis early on and say, well, you know, did you have a lot of trouble picking up vocabulary when you had to take you know, the last time you had to take a foreign language class, do you struggle if somebody's reading off a phone number? If so, then you've got maybe a little bit, you're going to need to spend a little bit more time than your classmates who have a larger capacity and they can just kind of pick the stuff up. And here we can fall back on some classic techniques as well. So when we're learning a new word, I mean, that's the challenge is here's this new sequence of sounds. And it's going to take me some time to build a representation of what those mean and to hook those up. And in the meantime, those sounds can kind of disappear from our short-term or working memory. So what are some ways to kind of get around that? The classic way is to create a little shortcut or an image, a mnemonic, that is very specific in that it ties the sound to the meaning. So anything you can kind of put together that is a little cue that's a, that will tell you, oh yeah, here's some of the sounds that will trigger it. And sometimes people worry that that'll kind of clutter up their memory or they'll be, you know, 20 years later, they're practicing, they're still having to come up with that funny little image in their head to remember the word. Don't worry about that. Those mnemonics, those images you might use to establish a new representation of a word, those will naturally go away over time. But that's something you could do. Once you know that that's the central challenge is here's these arbitrary sounds and here's this more complex, rich, nuanced meaning, you have to connect those two up. Once you know that, it becomes easier to design a strategy. And in case you haven't heard, our tickets for the Online Medical Education Summit are now live. So go to freemeded.org slash O-M-E-S for your free ticket. Join our physician speakers, education experts, and medical advisors, giving you the tips you need to survive medical school. Plus, join the best medical education content creators at their booths, ask them questions, and maybe even receive discounts. And in the spirit of free med ed, this event is free. So get your free ticket for our May 30th event now at freemeded.org slash O-M-E-S for the Online Medical Education Summit. We hope to see you there. I often hear that these visual mnemonics are kind of like a bridge. They're just there to help you get to the other side until you've strengthened that experience or that association in another way with your own experiences. So now you just know it innately. It's like physicians that they memorize certain things that are unique to their specialization because they go through it over and over and over. But as a student, we don't have that experience yet. So we just need that bridge until we can gain the experience necessary. Yeah, I think that's so well put, you know, a bridge that will get you from one place to another. And I mean, what you're describing, that that process of sort of maturation of the information to where you no longer need the story or the memory palace or the mnemonic, that does partly come about through that all important retrieving it over and over effortfully and actually using it. And remember, that's pretty adaptive for your brain too. If you never use a piece of information, why should you waste the space on it? You know, and it kind of teaches your brain in a little, in a little way that, okay, I actually do need this because I am remembering it every day. But you know, part of that as well is starting to form more of a conceptual understanding. And I think a lot of us, if we reflect on it, there are those interesting times when we've kind of clicked from, okay, I memorized this set of steps to, oh, 
this is how, oh, I understand conceptually how all these pieces fit together. And once you do that, it takes a huge burden off of memory and memory can kind of click into a different modality. And I think we all, if we think about it, have those experiences, right? Where it went from rote memorization to, I couldn't forget this if I tried because now it fits into this much bigger picture. You know, to just use a very mundane example, uh, I'm, a, I'm a knitter in my spare time. And I do remember when I went through kind of teaching myself the steps of knitting because I didn't take any classes. I, I learned it all kind of from online and from written materials. You know, I got to where I could say, okay, I can follow the directions in the pattern and, you know, knit two stitches together, then make a new stitch over here. And I can do that. But there was a point where I said, oh, I understand why this instruction is here. This is making it bigger, making it smaller. And not only does that make it more memorable? Like now I really, you know, I don't have to keep looking back at the pattern because I know what I'm doing. It increases my ability to apply it, right? Because now I can redesign a new pattern. I can tweak things a little bit. I can go backwards and change the steps slightly. So these are the really cool things that happen in that process of taking that information, that memorized stuff and making it your own. Exactly. But especially for those of us with bad memory, we need to work on that memory part a little harder initially before we're going to get to the conceptualization stage of it. And that's where I think a lot of the information that you mentioned earlier, where we're getting away from the don't memorize, understand mentality, because we're understanding more that the memory is kind of a vital part, at least in certain subjects and for certain material. We need to conquer that first. And then the concepts come along. Right. And, you know, I like how you're articulating how those things work together. And, and it is, I can absolutely say on the teaching side of what's going on in pedagogy right now, I mean, we are really having a good dialogue about that. And I'm at the point where I'm saying, you know, we used to be told, oh, do you want students to understand or do you want them to remember? And I'm saying, I want both. And I think my students need both and deserve both. And if we're efficient, if we do know how to acquire memory more rapidly, well, then that doesn't need to, you know, just totally dominate the whole process. I think that that was the fear was we'd be so worried at this micro level and so spending all of our time in this micro level of remembering terms that we would never get to that other side. And I'm saying we can do both and we need to do both. And we, we do. We have the research that shows that when you use more effective memory techniques, when you actually do learn more and know more on that kind of micro level, you are better able to think in a more nuanced, more expert-like way in an area. So if there's any teachers out there, if I can put your mind to ease at that, I'd like to do that. And for students, yes, you're going to need both. Perfect. That's exactly what I've been hearing and tried to get out to students and instructors is we need to utilize all the tools out there and to sort of condemn one side of it. We might be hurting ourselves or our students by not focusing on all of the aspects of learning that we know about. I know that we've covered a little bit here on mnemonics and similar techniques for the memory side of it and sort of going over the evolutionary purpose, I'm guessing that's where some of your terminology with adaptive memory comes in, correct? And then maybe yes. what about the retrieval practice and other techniques as well? Do we use these together or where are they most useful, I suppose? Are some better for certain techniques? Do you want to use everything all the time? But if there's not enough time, like how would a student that's very, very short on time kind of attack these issues? Right. And I think that that is something that as we become more sophisticated learners and learn how to learn, we do get better at kind of diagnosing, okay, what kind of memory task is it? And if we do have time, I think that's a good step. You know, am I trying to remember, for example, an episode, like so-called episodic memory. So when I think, okay, have I, when was the last time I was at my office and was this particular book on my desk when I was there? I'm tapping into episodic memory. If I want to remember some of the steps for addressing a particular, you know, disease or disorder, that's a more semantic or conceptual type of knowledge. There's even another that we haven't touched on, but I think is fascinating, which is prospective memory. And that's remembering to follow through on intentions. So like if you've ever been typing up an email and you're like, oh, and I've attached the document and then you get distracted, you type all the way to the end, you hit send and you never attach the thing. That's a memory failure. It really is. We don't really think about it as memory, but that really is. Or remembering, oh my gosh, did I turn off the iron before I left the house today? All of those are different forms of memory. So I mean, having just kind of a basic like, all right, what kind of memory is it that can help you know the steps that will help you improve in that area or prevent failures? And we are mostly, you know, talking today about that semantic or conceptual knowledge. We'll kind of focus on that, but I wanted to put that out there. As for students who are 
short on time and kind of a decent idea of what they're trying to remember or accomplish, acquire as far as knowledge in a limited time, what are some of the biggest time savers? Let's see. I do still think that making things as meaningful as possible, so kind of starting saying, okay, what's going to hold all these together? Remembering that very few of us, basically nobody can remember a very long undifferentiated list without some kind of a thing to hold it together. So doing that if we can. And then absolutely the retrieval practice and spacing are the two kind of bread and butter principles that are not just like, oh, a study here or a study here said this, but these are very long established, well understood principles. So as your listeners probably have thought about already, I mean, retrieval practice is that principle of like a test delivers more in terms of memory than basically anything else you can do with the time. And by test, we don't, it doesn't have to be something that somebody gives me and I sit down and have this big high stress experience about. A test can be any time I'm pulling it out of memory effortfully. And so that absolutely delivers. So do as little as possible in terms of just kind of reviewing, just kind of looking back at information. Being in front of, you know, having information in front of you doesn't make it stick. Closing the book, asking yourself, okay, what do I remember? And there's even this little other related effect called test potentiated learning. So even when we get a question wrong or we draw a blank or say, oh my gosh, I don't even know. That creates this little receptive window for reviewing it. So if there's a term and I'm trying to remember it, I close the book, I go, okay, do I remember it? I think I do. Oh, wait, no, I got it wrong. That's a great time to restudy. But the rest of the time, you know, just sort of passing our eyes over it is not going to deliver. It's not going to deliver value on time invested. So that's one thing. And, you know, just as an illustration, and again, very mundane illustration, you know, those codes on the back of credit cards, those are such a pain. They're so, I know I have such a hard time remembering them without some deliberate effort. But I look at them all the time. It's just that when I need to use it, I either look at the card or I look it up. I kind of take a little shortcut and I don't remember it for next time. The only way that I really start to be able to to remember those codes every time I get a new card is if I force myself to try to remember it, type it in, and if I get it wrong, then I can review. So anyway, we see that in practice all the time. And then, of course, the timing of study. Now, this gets, so we know, we've known for a very, very long time, again, that when you space your study over more different sessions, that delivers more on the time invested. So if you're studying for six hours, it's better in a two, three hour session or six, one hour sessions than one big monster session. So we know that, but we also know a little bit about why that works. And there's several reasons why, and all of those can be working together. And without kind of getting into that too much, I will say that what that tells us is partly spacing works because of context, right? So when we study, when we encounter any information, we associate it to what's around us and even what's inside of us. So our feelings, even our mood when we're studying, that sort of gets tangled up with what we're learning. And that's all fine. But when you do a big cram session, you're accidentally tying what you're learning to that one single context. And that context is going to be different when you need to retrieve the information. So if I'm sitting around and I'm kind of worried or bored and I'm in a one particular room and I'm learning my material, I got to go take a test on that in a different room at a different time of day, in a different mood. And that can create some stumbling blocks. If I know the information well, it may not matter. But if we're talking about getting every little advantage, then this might matter. So what I can do to kind of break that down, let's say that I have to do all my studying in a six-hour time block. That's all I can do. I can be very mindful to, of course, take breaks, but perhaps even think about moving around physically, going to a different room in the library, different room in my house, mixing up the kind of studying I'm doing. So I might spend some of that actively quizzing with a friend or working in a study group and spend some other time testing myself and then move around and do a different study activity somewhere else. So that may help a little bit, again, knowing what the underlying principles are. We hear so much about spacing the sessions over time, but I don't think I've heard too much about the environment except for the common conception that we should study in the same type of environment or as close to it as our actual test is going to be. Not necessarily that it would be beneficial to study from maybe the bedroom at one point and the library from another. So that's an interesting twist. I haven't really heard too much about that aspect of it before. Right. And, you know, I think this is one of the, if not biggest, most consequential misunderstandings about 
how memory and studying works and context, it's a still a pretty good one. And I think back when I was in grad school so long ago, I had the pleasure of being able to attend talks by one of our faculty members, Robert Bjork, who's a towering figure in establishing applied memory research. I mean, he knows more about this than basically anybody. And he was saying, yeah, this is something when I, I mean, he would consult with nuclear power plants. He would consult with all these people who are trying to really teach people very important high stakes information and be absolutely sure that when the time came, they would be able to remember, okay, what's the shutdown sequence or how does this piece of equipment work or what do we do? And he would say, you know, that was the conclusion that some of his clients would come to. It's like, well, we need to teach people and have them rehearse under these very realistic circumstances, perfectly realistic. And he would say, well, yes, but if you have them rehearse and kind of study across many different contexts, then it becomes less tied to any single one of those contexts, right? So yeah, if I know that I'm going to have to remember this information in this one room on this particular kind of test, I can either go down the road of trying to replicate that every single time, or I can say, you know what, I'm going to study on the bus. I'm going to study at a restaurant. I'm going to study in my house. I'm going to study in the morning and the night. And then that effect of context does tend to fall away. So in theory, this should be something that we can use. So I feel pretty confident giving that advice to students. You know, I know I love the idea about routine. That, that's great for motivational purposes. But when we come to a memory purpose, then it's better to really mix it up. And that also gives us the benefit of saying, well, you know what? This environment actually worked well or this technique worked particular well for me and this one didn't. So you can refine your efforts over time. Interesting. So if you wake up and study on your phone or tablet before you even get out of bed, and then maybe later on you study on your computer sitting at your desk, and then maybe that evening you do one more rehearsal of the material without any technology, just seeing what you can remember and mixing up these different times and different environments and different purposes, and especially adding the the multiple repetitions and the rehearsal of the material can really be a strong study plan for students that might be listening. I think that's, yeah, that's perfect. I love how you've described it. And that is great advice. And especially in this contemporary era where we do have the technology, you know, we don't have to go to a library. We don't have to have our books available. There's so many to-go apps and things we can even do on our phone. And many of us, you know, with non-traditional students being such an important component of teaching and learning today and us all feeling like we're juggling more and have just smaller time blocks everywhere, that's great news, right? Let's take it with us. And again, in theory, this should make you less subject to that dreaded, you know, blank out. Oh my gosh, I know I know it, but why can't I retrieve it? That happens when you're in this new and unfamiliar context. Because let's face it, even if you were able to go to that testing room and visit it and do all your studying right there, you're going to be in a different mood. You're going to have a different time of day. You're going to feel differently. So you need to make yourself immune to context not further go down the road of getting bound up with that context. That's my advice to students. Wow, I like that a lot. I think that's great advice. Well, since we're getting closer to the end here, do you have any last minute words of advice before we get to the last few questions here? Well, let's see. I think that I would encourage students to really reflect and do some very honest self-accounting, again, of what techniques work for them and which ones don't. And I'd also really encourage students to kind of adapt another concept that's gotten to be so important in education today, which is mindset theory. And, you know, basically this is about saying, really refocusing people on what it takes to succeed, which is not, you know, oh, I was born with this particular genius or talent or, you know, these things are, it's debatable whether these are important, sure, but it's really most productive for us when we focus on the effort component. And I'm sensing that your audience is probably a a very hard-charging, high-achieving bunch, so they may have hit on this already in one form or another, but really saying, you know, even with memory, let's not focus on what's hardwired. Yes, you know, we might have a bigger phonological loop or a better ability to put things into context. We might be faster or slower in some areas, but this is absolutely about technique. And absolutely, if you can remember some trivia, movie line, how to play a video game, if you can do that, you can remember 
any other kind of information in any other context if it taps into similar mechanisms. So really, really looking at that part of it and adopting that as your guiding principles going forward is going to be helpful. And really staying abreast of all the really exciting ways that this research is developing and also the the really neat ways that we finally learned how to apply it. I mean, things like spacing and retrieval practice, we have known about these for decades, but it's really just now that we're starting to say, well, what does this look like to really usefully apply these? And it's just now that this is finally making it out into the teaching and learning community in a big way. So definitely keep an eye open. Hopefully people will develop a natural interest in these as well. Because if you're, if teaching and learning is your thing, if you are a learner, you're in memory. Like it or not, memory is a part of your life. I like it. And we all have to be lifelong learners in healthcare. So learning these techniques earlier is just going to benefit you throughout the rest of your academic career and occupation. Yeah, absolutely. And that's one of the beautiful things about memory. It has many frustrating sides, but one of the beautiful things about memory is there's this snowball or rich get richer effect. I mean, our brains are very efficient about what they they choose to spend capacity on. However, the more you know, the more you can know. And, you know, when we look at people around us who are accomplished professionals or or even if they have a hobby or a passion and they seem like they can just remember and pick up information just like that. I mean, it's so tempting to go, oh, wow, they have a special ability. No, they don't. It's because they've learned, they know, now they can acquire more information more quickly and easily and so on. So when you start going down this road later on down your career, we would just predict that it's only going to get better. I like it. So If there is one thing that you could change, if you went back in time, what would it be? Oh my gosh, in my own own career, I wish that we had no more about mindset and a very closely related concept, which is imposter syndrome. That was just barely beginning to be understood, I think, at the beginning of my career. And I think I could have saved myself a lot of kind of wasted effort and had a little bit more joy in what I'm doing if I had realized um, the way we try to get students to realize right now, which is that struggle's normal. Struggle's fine. It's not school and career is not just about sorting out who's got it from who doesn't. I think that it would have been a, a bit of an easier path. But, you know, overall, you know, the good side is now I get to share that discovery with far more students. And I can say quite authentically, you know, I've had the struggles too. I've sat with the books and said, why, you know, why can everybody else get this and I can't? But then I was able to discover some of the principles of learning and after the fact, be able to understand that struggle. So I wish that that had come on the scene a little bit sooner. And I wish that we'd promoted it a little bit more aggressively, but, you know, better late than never. (laughs) <laughs> Definitely agree. Those are two topics, especially the imposter syndrome aspect that it seems like we all have a high likelihood of facing, especially more higher achieving graduate level type learners from last I heard anyway, seem to have even a higher level of this, which sounds counterintuitive, but something that a lot of us are going to face. So knowing about it's probably going to be very beneficial. Yeah, Absolutely. What are a few resources that you would recommend to learners that want to learn more about learning and memory? Oh, wow. Okay. So that is a favorite topic of mine because I'm also just passionate about books. I like writing them when I can, and I love to just consume nonfiction. And so I always have my antenna up for books that are a great read but also really get the science right, since that is absolutely so critical. So a couple of favorite resources that you just can't go wrong with include a now classic book, Make It Stick, which is published by Harvard University Press, which also published my book, so that's a kind of a favorite as well. But this, through stories and narrative, gets across, particularly in the case of retrieval practice and some of those meaningful interpretation angles, which I talked about earlier. So that's a, a wonderful book and a wonderful read. Now, a bestseller, which people have probably heard of if they're listening to this podcast, is the book Moonwalking with Einstein. Now, even though this was not written by a psychologist, I wish it had been, but it's, it's written by a journalist. He really gets the science right as well. And there's a story into it, which I'm not going to get into any spoilers, but there's a narrative that carries through, which is absolutely <laughs> gripping. And it is so well put together that I've actually used it as a textbook in one of my mini courses that I put together a few years ago. In lieu of a traditional textbook. I said, you know, we're going to read this. This is going to be fun and you'll get all the techniques. And lastly, another real classic 
book with perfect science is the, called The Invisible Gorilla. And this talks about, a, this is really more focused around attention, but it definitely gets into memory. And, you know, while we haven't talked about it too much in this conversation, as you probably know, you know, if you don't pay attention to something, you're not going to pick it up. So attention and memory are really closely related. And so that book as well talks about, you know, how so much gets by us and we just don't even understand our own cognitive processes half the time. And it helps us learn to be alert for those. So those are great. Now, if you want to know more about retrieval practice in particular, that super ultra powerful secret weapon technique, that technique has its own website, believe it or not. It's retrievalpractice.org and that has wonderful stuff. And also the learning scientist is another beautifully put together website with just absolutely solid science behind it. And it's great because it has some like downloadable infographics and things like that. So it's not like you're going to sit down and read 200 pages. They are just brilliant at boiling down some of the key teaching and learning principles, putting them on a page. And they've also got some really nice blog posts and and other articles that kind of take apart some of these principles too. So that's where I would send people for resources. (laughs) <laughs> Those are definitely great resources. And we did have Dr. Megan Samaraki on from The Learning Scientist at around episode seven, I believe. And yeah, Moonwalking with Einstein gets mentioned all the time. I think Make It Six been mentioned a few times and was one of my introductions to a lot of these topics too. I haven't actually heard of The Invisible Gorilla, so I'll have to check that one out. Where can the audience find more about you? Well, I have a website as well with a blog that's mostly about, again, teaching in higher ed, but definitely some other much more kind of general appeal pieces having to do with memory. So my blog is michellemillerphd.com. So they can find me there. I'm fairly active on academic Twitter, so they can find me on Twitter as well. And I've got some other ways that people can engage with different angles of the whole Minds Online philosophy, so what I put out there in my book. So there's everything from talking to book uh, groups to a Slack channel where people can discuss. And I also do work individually with different even corporate groups and school groups to help them take a deeper dive into to some of these really critical issues. So you can find it all there. Perfect. And we'll definitely put all of those in the show notes as well. Well, Dr. Michelle Miller, I want to thank you so much for coming on the show and giving the students such great value. Oh, you are so welcome. Thanks for the great questions. We hope you enjoyed this episode. For links to connect to us, email us, or for previous episodes, please see the show notes. We'd also love to hear from you. So please send an email or join us on the Medical Anemonist Mastermind Facebook group. Any ideas, tips, tricks, people that you'd like to hear interviewed, we'd love to hear it. Any advice to make the show better and more enjoyable would be greatly appreciated.